Good to see all of you to, again today. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, we just appreciate your presence. You know, it'd be hard to have church without you here. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be, I know, we do have church. I mean, I can come up here and pray, and I can have church by myself, but it's a whole lot more fun when there's a lot of folks here, and uh, we just appreciate you being here. Now, I'm going to use this handheld today because that uh, lapel mic just keeps cutting out, and it, it's cutting out at, at times when we're trying to record and our messages, and uh, it makes it difficult to piece that together. So I'm going to uh, use this until we can buy some new one which hopefully will be real soon. I told you I would give you a report. Last Sunday's offering on our building fund was uh, $942.97. Okay. Now, that's, that's a good start, but it's got to go a long ways, okay? But you know what? We serve a big God, and He's going to help us get there. He's going to help us get there. I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Now, we started two weeks ago on this series on the seven churches of Asia. And I'm not going to, these messages are not intended to be preaching every Sunday on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I talked about how these churches have a meaning that was literal for those seven churches. And then there's the meaning for the church of today. And then there's the meaning for you personally that you can take into account. So there's lots of symbolism and lots of things involved here in these churches. And we talked, uh, the first church, about the, the uh, lo- leaving your first love. And it seemed like last Sunday's uh, message that the Holy Spirit preached, that I didn't preach, that the Holy Spirit preached, carried right into that of people losing their first love. And so God honored the message the previous Sunday and there was even the, the Wednesday following that, people was talking about it. And then last Sunday, still talking about it. And so I appreciate God doing that. That, that shows me and, and that we're on the right track with what we're preaching. Now, lest I forget, I, had, uh, I spoke with some people previously about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, some different things. I had questions about the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, us being a non-denominational church, we attract people from all faiths. We attract Baptists, Methodists, uh, Lutheran, you name it, Catholic, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness, hopefully, uh, <laughs> Mormons, hopefully. You know, we attract all these people, but they have questions. Wednesday night, Brother Jim Berger is going to be teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Am I correct? You need to be here. If you've got questions, your questions can be answered on Wednesday night as we go through this biblical teaching. There's also information out in the foyer to help you with those questions. You can come to me. You can come to Paul. You can come to Brother Jim. You can come to Brother Lee. Any of us uh, will be able to answer your questions of Brother Robbie about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, we're, we don't back down from, from the Holy Spirit. We're not shy about preaching the Holy Spirit. And we're certainly not embarrassed of the Holy Spirit. Amen? I'm not embarrassed of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. If he wants to do it, so be it. Let him do it. That's what I say. Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse number 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty. I want you to underline that word poverty in your Bible because we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But you are rich, in parentheses it says. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are, of the, are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until, the, until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the word that you spoke here this morning through the message in tongues and interpretation that you, uh, we are yours and you, you are ours, Lord. I thank you for that. And I just pray now, Lord, that as we enter into this message, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be with us to speak with authority, boldness, and truth. And we'll give you praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. We talked about the, the seven candlesticks and the angel of the seven churches. And, and you know, and how that these, these 
churches represented seven literal churches, but they also represent the church universal, the church worldwide. And, and our church has a candlestick. And our church has an angel. And uh, Brother Dan and I have been talking about some things, uh, uh, the message to the seven churches. And, and yesterday was talking about, you know, the, the marquee we have out here in the front. And we put messages on there. Well, what was the message that God wrote to each of the seven churches? If the, if the church at Smyrna had a marquee, what would the message be on it? If the church at Ephesus had a marquee like we have, what would have been the message that God gave to them? The church that left the first love. The church at Smyrna, what would the message be? The church that was faithful to the end. I wonder what the message would be on our marquee of Restoration Christian Fellowship. Now I want you to keep something in mind. The church is not a building. The church is people. When, when the Lord was speaking to the seven churches in Asia, when He was speaking to the church at Smyrna, He wasn't just speaking to an individual. He was speaking to a collection of people. You are the collection of people that represent Restoration Christian Fellowship. When you walk out these doors and go out into the world, you represent Restoration Christian Fellowship as well, certainly first and foremost, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when God gives a message to the church, He gives it to us collectively, but also as individuals. So He was giving the, the message to these churches collectively. Now, was everybody... In, in the church in Ephesus, did everybody in that church, every single person, have they all left their first love? Or was that just the common theme of that church? Probably not every single person in that church had left their first love. But it had become so predominant in that church that that became its message. What is the message to Restoration Christian Fellowship? Everybody in here? Full and power of the Holy Spirit? Would that be the message? Does that mean that every single person in here is flowing in the Holy Spirit the way they ought to? Probably not. Probably not. But what do we want the world to know? What do we want Hayden and Warrior to know about RCF? What is the message that we want the world to see about? We want them to know, first of all, that we care about people. And that we love all people. It doesn't matter if they're wealthy or if they're not. That doesn't matter. We want people to know that there's a God who loves them and that wants to, work, that wants to bless them and wants to bring them to a place where they can live peacefully and happily on this earth in preparation for life ever after to be with the Lord forever. I don't believe that God has appointed us to a life of misery. I just don't believe that. I, can't ex I just can't accept that. And that's why I, I told you a while ago to underline that word poverty because we're going to talk about that in a minute because uh, I, I want to share with you some, some thoughts that the Lord has given to me. First of all, I want to tell you a little bit about the city of Smyrna. Okay? So bear with me. Uh, I, I'm trying to give you background to each one of these cities. First of all, Smyrna was a, tr a great trade city, much like Ephesus, about 35 miles north of Ephesus, Located in what is now known as the country of Turkey. Okay? It was a city of wealth and commercialism. It was a very beautiful city. It claimed to be the glory of Asia. That was its fame to claim. The glory of Asia. There were many, many temples located in Smyrna. Now, Smyrna had broad, straight streets. Okay? And at the end of these broad, straight streets, there would be a temple. Some down by the sea and some up further inland closer to the hills. But the city itself set on a flat part. There was the temple of Sibyl by the sea. There was the temples of Apollo. Asclopius, which was a, a serpent. Aphrodite. There was the temple of Zeus. Uh, and there were many other temples in there. So everywhere the people, the Christians looked, there were temples to heathen gods. Now you put yourself as a Christian living in Smyrna. And just about any place you went in Smyrna, you saw a temple to a heathen god. The Christians at Smyrna were poor. They were persecuted. They were considered in poverty. 
But yet they were faithful. The church at Smyrna had a candlestick that shone bright. The church at Smyrna, in the midst of all this persecution, in the midst of all this poverty, in the midst of all this that they, they experienced themselves, but in the midst of all this heathen worship, in the midst of all of this, which Jesus called the synagogue of Satan, how would you like to have a church located in the synagogue of Satan? You think it's bad around here? That's what Jesus said. It was actually a synagogue of Satan. But that's where the church of Smyrna was. And I want you to notice, when I read the scripture, Jesus did not find one thing wrong with the church at Smyrna to warn them about. When he spoke to the church at Ephesus, he, he praised them for their works. He praised them for their deeds against the Nicolaitans. He praised them for, uh, for really uh, holding on to pure doctrine. But he said, I have somewhat against thee. You don't find that at the church at Smyrna. Did he say anywhere in there, I've got something against you? Not one thing did he say. When I hold on a minute. You mean God was okay that the church was persecuted? That the church was poor? That the church had all this? You mean God was okay with all that? We'll talk about that in a minute. They had a candlestick shining in a very dark place. And it shone bright in a dark, sinful city. Politically, Smyrna was a very proud city. It was another free city, much like Ephesus. In other words, criminals could come to the, to the, to the place there in Ephesus. I mean, in Smyrna, they could find a, a safe zone, and criminals could live and dwell there free from being arrested. So it attracted criminals much like Ephesus did. We find that it was called the paradise of municipal vanity. The paradise of municipal vanity. It claimed to be the first in beauty, the first in Caesar worship, and it was the birthplace of Homer. Okay? It looked with contempt upon the poor, humble Christians and despised them as people of no importance. Do you feel like you're unimportant? Do you feel like your faith is unimportant to what's going on in the world today? Smyrna lived that. The church at Smyrna lived in that place. Its religion, the spirit of Rome embraced, was being embraced throughout the known world at that time. What is the spirit of Rome? The spirit of Rome was an embodied, embodied in the emperor. Thus, emperor worship had begun, which eventually led to the worship of Caesar and became mandatory. The spirit of Rome was that, you remember when Rome said, when Paul was talking about how important his Roman citizenship was? Rome, Rome was the end thing. And that spirit of worship, that spirit of idolatry, that spirit of, of Satanism enveloped that entire religious community of the then known world and was known as, they, as the spirit of Rome. There's still a spirit of Rome. And I'll leave it there. But the worship, emperor worship or Caesar worship, what, they, what happened in, this, in, this, time, in this, this time, everyone in Smyrna had to request a certificate in writing declaring their allegiance to Caesar. If you did not carry that letter of writing declaring that you were allies with Caesar and that you worshipped Caesar that you worshipped the emperor then you were considered an outlaw how many of those Christians at Smyrna you think carried that letter none would you oh you're telling me no you're telling me no you're sitting there oh no I'd never do it I'd never do it I'd never do it there are all kinds of certificates in writing out there today that we sign every day and we, we adhere to and we walk with not even realizing what we're doing. Selling away our faith to what this world has to offer. They had a certificate. If you didn't have it, you were considered an outlaw. We find that the life for Christians in Smyrna was dangerous. The large Jewish population in Smyrna, they stopped at nothing to obliterate the Christian church. 
There was nothing they wouldn't do. How many ever heard of Polycarp? I'm not talking about a fish. Polycarp was known as the Bishop of Smyrna. Okay? Now, Polycarp was in that transitional period between the dying off of the apostles and that inner, in that inner mission uh, and transition from that generation to the second generation Christian. The first generation Christians, those who, some who actually had talked to Jesus and seen him, and then those who had experienced the day of Pentecost, and those who had, had experienced the revival uh, meetings of Paul and Peter and, and Stephen and the different ones that went around establishing churches and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the earthquakes and the miracles and on and on and on. As you read all throughout the book of Acts, they had experienced all that. Well, they were dying. And this new generation of Christian was coming along that you found at Ephesus that had left the first love. But in Smyrna, Polycarp was the bishop, and he was the one that was going to, in this transition period. And Polycarp was, was known as a very simple, actually unlearned man. He wasn't the, the intelligence that many people would have required of him had he been in Corinth. Or had he been in anywhere else. But in that little simple, poverty stricken, humble church at Smyrna, Polycarp was the perfect leader. Because he was a man of faith. And I want to read you what happened. Now, he lived to be 86 years old, and he was despised by the citizens of Smyrna. But he lived under the protection of the Holy Spirit. Why he lived for 86 years is beyond anybody's imagination because he was hated so much by the people at Smyrna. But somehow he made it to the year, uh, to, the, to 86 years old. But I want to read you what happened to him. At 86, he was about ready, uh, they, the, the people at Smyrna wanted to arrest him. And so many of his friends and associates said, You need to go and hide him. You need to run. He said, Nah. Nah, I'm not going to run. I'm just going to stay right here. Let God's will be done. Whatever happens, whatever happens. So they came to Polycarp, and they demanded of him his letter, his certificate of writing, stating his allegiance to Caesar. He didn't have it. He didn't have one. He could freely confess that he was a Christian. He was given the choice. Worship the Godhead of Caesar or die. Now you, you think about it. You put yourself in this place. Worship Caesar or die. The Jews led the shouts of the mob. Who led the shouts of the mob against Jesus? The Jews. The Jews of Smyrna led the shouts saying, this is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the destroyer of the gods, all to be known as a destroyer of the gods. All to be known as the destroyer of the gods of our world. Are you known as a destroyer, or as you know, are you known as a get-alonger? I don't know how good that English that is, but, <laughs> but it works. They said, he's the destroyer of the gods who teaches many neither to offer sacrifice nor to worship. Then Polycarp was given the choice, sacrifice to Caesar or be burned. How many of y'all like fire? You ever, how many ever burned your finger or hand on anything? Don't feel very good, does it? Now, if you had the choice... Worship Caesar, or we're going to burn you alive, what would you do? Now you think about this. This is not a, this is not a fairy tale. This is real. This isn't recorded in history. Worship Caesar or be burned. And this is his answer. <laughs> I love this. This is, in quotes, 80 and 6 years I have served Christ and he has never done me wrong. How can I bless? I'm getting chill bumps. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? <laughs> well, 
Well, it was the Sabbath day, and yet the Jews were foremost in getting their sticks and wood together to start their fire, therefore, therefore breaking their own Sabbath law. That's how intent they were upon killing him. Polycarp said, it is well. I fear not the fire that burns for a season and after a while is quenched. <laughs> Why do you delay? Come, do your will. It says, as the flames licked his body, he prayed this prayer. I thank thee thou hast graciously thought me worthy of this day. And of this hour, that I may receive a portion in the number of the martyrs in the cup of thy Christ. And he died. That was what it was like for the Christian in Smyrna. And you think you can't live for God in this life. And you think it's too hard to live a Christian life today. The church is too demanding. They got too many do's and don'ts. They want to tell me how to live. I want to tell you something. The church don't want to tell you how to live. The scriptures tell you how to live. The author of those scriptures tells you how to live. The author of those words tells you how your life is supposed to go. Not the church. You won't find a list of do's and don'ts at RCF, but you will find the Word of God preached authoritatively and without being watered down. Because that's what's going to get you to heaven. Polycarp, they wanted to nail him to a something symbol to a cross and burn him on it. And he said, no, just lay me down. I'll go willingly. You don't have to nail me down. And they burned him alive. To be a Christian in Smyrna, you were considered a hero because you outlasted them. Now that's how bad it was. Now let's look at what Jesus said to this church. Now that you know where their candlestick is, now that you know why their candlestick was shining bright in the synagogue of Satan, Dan, in the midst of all this heathenistic worship, the church at Smyrna stood tall. Their light shone bright, and the Lord found nothing to condemn them for. Nothing. Nothing to find fault with. Amazing that he couldn't find anything in that kind of situation. But he says, I am the first and the last. The first because all things were made by Him. He was before all things. The foundation of the church was laid by Him. He is the last because all things are made for Him. He will be the judge of all things. And the church will finally come to the rest. To come to rest through Him. The church of Smyrna was not going to find rest in the city of Smyrna. They was only going to find their rest when they found their rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will only find rest and peace and comfort and tranquility when you fall in love with Jesus Christ. But if you are not falling in love with Jesus, if you are not following Jesus, you of all men are most miserable. And Jesus is the only one that can cure it. He's the only one that can cure it. He's the first and the last. He said, the one who was dead and is now alive, he was dead because he died for our sins on the cross. He purchased your salvation. He purchased my salvation. He purchased the salvation of those at Smyrna. He purchased the salvation of those at Ephesus. He purchased the salvation of those at Restoration Christian Fellowship. Over 2,000 years ago, he purchased your salvation. He celebrated this salvation with Holy Communion. Now he is alive. The one who was dead and now is alive, he rose again on the third day. He rose for our justification. He rose for our sanctification. He rose for our salvation. He lives to make intercession for you. He lives to make intercession for me. He lives to apply that salvation to us. And we celebrate his life every single day. Do you celebrate the life of Jesus every day? 
And then it goes on, it says, in the contents of this letter, the spiritual condition of this church. And this, I want to focus on this for just a minute. Outwardly, the condition of that church was they lived in poverty. Now, all of a sudden, I mean, just right now, everybody would look. All right, Brother Rick. Here's a church that lives in poverty. Where was the blessing? Where was the confession that they could have? They, they, were, they were the head and not the tail. Why were they living in such poverty? Well, I, I got to thinking about that. And I went back and I, look, I studied, I went through a little bit of history. And in the ancient world, there were two classes of people. Rich and poor. Rich and poor. It wasn't until this nation, the United States of America, was birthed in 1776 that the middle class was developed. This nation is responsible for the middle class. Okay? So, in the ancient world, you were the rich or you were poor. And the church... Now, let me qualify this by saying this. How many of you know more about the Bible today than you did when you first started studying the Bible? Okay. Are there more truths that you've learned? Have you learned something that maybe beforehand you thought, well, I didn't necessarily believe that, but now I see it in a different light. I, I, I understand it better now. Okay. And what do you have? Let me see your Bible, Pat. You've got it written right here, right? To study and read any day, any time you want to, this book. Did the church at Smyrna have this book? No. Can I suggest to you, or make this, that they did not understand all that they could have in Jesus Christ. And so in the then ancient world, you either accepted your poverty or you made deals with the rich and sold your soul to the rich to get in and become wealthy. They didn't know, Brother Lee. They didn't understand all about the blood covenant. They didn't understand that they had all this, that, that they didn't have to accept that. They didn't understand that they had to accept poverty. They thought that was their lot in life. Just like that teaching has been passed down through the ages to the churches in America today that people say, well, this is just the lot that God has chosen for me. I've got to accept it. Friend, we don't have to accept it. This nation said, no, we're not going to accept the rich or the poor. We're going to develop a middle class and God bless the United States of America to come to this earth, to come to this nation, this land, and to develop where people didn't have to accept what the rich handed down to them. I want to accept what God has for me. Now, the reason you're saying, are you telling me then it was God's will for them to live in poverty? Does it say anywhere in there that that was God's will? Does it say anywhere in there when Jesus spoke to them and you have perfectly done my will? Does it say that? Does it say anywhere in there that it was a sin for them to live in that poverty? No. Friends, if you want to live in it, you can and you still go to heaven. As long as you accept Jesus Christ. That's, that's the bottom line. You, you can accept what this world wants to give you if you want to, and you can live in it and be miserable in it. As long as you follow Jesus Christ. Or you can learn what the Scripture has said. You can become a student of the Word of God, and you can learn what God has appropriated to us through authority and through the covenant and through the blood of Jesus, and you can say, I don't have to accept that anymore. And when you go back through history, you'll find that churches began to realize, even the Church of England began to realize, you know what? We don't have to accept poverty. We don't have to accept that. God didn't appropriate that, that the Christian had to be poor. There are people believe that to be a Christian, you got to be poor. That you got to give everything up. I'll tell you what you got to give up. You give up sin. You give up sin. That's what you give up. You give up sin. God said, I want you to be the head and not the tail. I want you to be blessed coming in and going out. Was the church this morning blessed going in and coming out with physical blessings? No. Why? Because they didn't know any better. They thought that's how they had to live. 
They thought that was the way they were supposed to live. So God wasn't going to condemn them for living that way. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to tell them they were sinning because it wasn't a sinful thing. But he also didn't, he said, you are outwardly poor, but you're rich in the Spirit. Now, that's certainly what God is more concerned about, y'all. But that's not to say that God's not concerned about the other, but God is more concerned about our spirit. And that's what we learn from this. They were rich in spiritual blessings. They were rich in faith and hope and good works. And he goes on and he says, and there are many sufferings and tribulations. And I want to look at this word sufferings and tribulations here. This word is a Greek word, ellipsis. And it means slowly crushed as by a boulder. Slowly crushed as by a boulder. In other words, someone just brings the boulder and gently sets it on you, and it doesn't kill you immediately. You just lay there, and slowly the weight of that boulder continues to push the life out of you. What does that signify to you in this life? Does that not signify the pressures of this life? The pressures of everyday living? Have you ever felt like that every day that that boulder just gets bigger and stronger and heavier? And every day, that's what it's talking about here in this tribulation. This pressure. Friend, I know, I know you and I, we go through these pressures. You deal with this pressure every day. The pressure of just getting from, from morning to night sometimes is almost unbearable. The pressure of getting through this day sometimes just becomes more than some people can handle. And they take their own lives. The number one killer among teenagers is what? Suicide. Because you see, it's like a boulder set up on them. It's a boulder. The tribulation. Jesus said, I know your sufferings. I know your tribulation. He said, I know what that boulder is. And then over in the New Testament, you see, here's something that, that maybe the people at Smyrna didn't understand this. Jesus said this. All ye who are weary and heavy laden come unto me and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light come unto me maybe they hadn't read that yet now did jesus say because you suffered tribulation and because you suffered the pressures of life and they were like a boulder crushing you did he say you sinned because of that nope But you see, in 2014, we've learned what Jesus said in Matthew, that we can come unto him. But there are some people sitting in church this morning, right here in this building, that still don't understand that. I remember there was a dear little lady in our church, and she was a blessed lady. She was so faithful. And I've said this a hundred times, but I'm going to say it again. She would stand up to testify. Brother Dan, she'd say, I, I can almost say it verbatim because she said it every time church gathered. I want y'all to pray for me. I want to thank the Lord my Savior for saving my soul, and I want y'all to pray that I'll make it to the bitter end. I believe that dear lady went to heaven, but she didn't have to suffer in this life. It was something that she chose. By her confession. By her confession. The bitter end. The bitter end. Jesus said, I am the first and the last. The last isn't bitter. He served, he said, the last shall be first. You see, when he turned the water into wine, somebody come to him and said, Hey, why why are you say serving this good wine at the beginning? You're supposed to, I mean, at the end, you're supposed to serve this at the beginning until people get drunk, and then they don't worry about how bad it tastes at the end. You see, when you drink from the, from the cup of Jesus, it's never bitter. It's never bitter. It doesn't have to be bitter, y'all. That lady wasn't sinning, but she just chose to live her life with that kind of outlook. Are you living your life that way? Is that the kind of outlook you have on life? Is that what your life consists of? 
Christ will be faithful in the sufferings, the pressures of life. He will reward those who are diligent in their prayer life to help them overcome, and he will become their rest. i got to hurry. He goes on, he says, I know your enemies. I know that the, the synagogue of Satan, those who pretend to be Christians, those that, uh, that think that they are a church when actually they are the synagogue of Satan. You see, those temples, they professed to be the church. That was the religion. That was, that, was, that was where you were to worship. You weren't to worship down there at that little church, poor, persecuted people down at Smyrna that didn't have a pot to cook in. <laughs> I had to think of how I was going to say that there, y'all. <laughs> You've heard it different than that. I'm sure you have. <laughs> they didn't have anything. And so we find here that, you know, Jesus said, I'll be faithful to you. I know who your enemy is. They were to, they were to stay away. From those people. And not to stray from the purity of the gospel. These, the church, the synagogue of Satan persecuted true worshipers. They, they used God to promote Satan. Does anybody use God to promote Satan today? Just watch your TV. He knows their future trials. He said you got to be ready to fight back. The devil knows the time. He says a period of ten days. A period of 10 days. Let's look at that for just a minute here as we get over here. Do not fear, verse number 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Now, that 10 days, you know, listen. A literal 10 days, 10, one day is 1,000 years, a year is 10,000. I don't know. That's not important to me right here. That doesn't, I'm not worried about that. All I know is this. That 10 days has a limit to it. That's what I want to look at. And when that 10 days is up, the devil's day is done. You hear what I'm saying? When God says, okay, devil, the 10 days is up, then brother, it's over. And I don't care how much he begs, pleads, or whatever he says, it's done. It's done. Just like Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. He's going to look at the devil and he's going to say the ten days is over. It's done. And those who endure to the end will have a crown of life. You will receive the crown of glory. Now we find that in, in Smyrna, there are three different types of crown. Now we have find a, a Greek word for crown as uh, di diadem. Uh, and we got the word diadem from it, okay? But that's not the word that was used here. Let me, I've got so excited I've changed my notes all around. I can't even find where my note is to give you the proper pr pronunciation for that word. All right. We find that the word was actually here, Stephanos, okay? And that means three different meanings to it. This crown of life had three different meanings. And I'm getting ready to wrap up. First of all, the first meaning of Stephanos was it was a crown of victory. Raise your hands. A crown of victory. Now, this crown of victory, remember last week we, uh, we talked about at Ephesus they had the, the Olympic Games? Well, Smyrna had many like that as well. They were big. The Greeks were big into that kind of stuff. And so to the, you know, the winner would receive a crown. He won the race. He won the game. He won the match. To the Christian who wins the race, he gets the crown. The victor's crown. I don't know if it's going to have raised hands on it or not, Brother Jim, but it's going to be a victor's crown. Okay? Then the second meaning of this word Stephanos means the festival crown, and this was a crown that was given at marriages. In, in, in the Greek uh, system, when they would get married, two would come together, they would place a crown upon them in, in, their, fest in, their, in their, uh, their reception. They would receive this crown as now they are married and, and it's a festival, it's a party. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the gathering together. Oh, how many of you ever go to a birthday party 
a little kid's birthday party, and they get the little birthday hats. How many of y'all ever wore one of them? Yeah, and the kids just love them, don't they? The kids just love them. Can I submit to you that when we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to have a birthday hat on. We're going to have a party hat on. We're going to have on a party crown. We're going to have on a party crown that says, I've won. I've overcome. I've made it. I've won the race. I'm married now. The bride and the groom. Who's the groom? Jesus. Who's the bride? The church. You're going to get a crown. Signifying that marriage has been consummated. Then we go on. There's one more meaning to this crown of life. It's the laurel crown. The laurel, the wreath, okay? And that crown signified faithful service. Faithful service. In Smyrna, when they put that that wreath on you, that meant you were faithful to your country. You were faithful to those who were over you. You were a faithful servant. What did Jesus say? He said that, Thomas, and he said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You're going to get a crown. You're going to get a laurel wreath that says, Well done, good and faithful servant. So this crown of life, it's more than just a little crown, a princess crown, folks. It has meaning behind it. And this is what Jesus said to him who overcomes. He will inherit. He will have the crown of life. How many of you want that crown of life? And then he's, the last thing he said, and the second death shall not hurt you. In other words, there will, you will never, ever, ever, ever be separated from God. Never will you be separated from God. You will live with God forever. The second death, the spiritual death, will never hurt you. It will never come nigh your dwelling. So this letter to the church at Smyrna was a letter of encouragement to a church that was in a very wicked place. A letter of encouragement that comes to us knowing that God knows everything. That God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That God has everything under control. That God loves you. God cares about you. And God wants to bless you. But more than anything else today, God wants to save your soul. He wants to give you the crown of life. He wants you to have it. Do you want it? Paul, would you come? Do you want the crown of life? You say, brother, I've already got it. Well, great. Let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, this morning, the Spirit spoke to our church. Before I ever preached, there was a message in tongues and an interpretation. Did you listen to it? Did, he, did in that message it say something along the line? I know that I'm the one that, that interpreted it, but you have to remember that's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I'm having to go back and kind of remember. Uh, wasn't it something along the line that you say you love God? But your heart is far from me. That's kind of like the church at Ephesus, wasn't it? Going back to that. Maybe you're here this morning. And you've got a confession of loving Jesus. But your life depicts something far different. Remember what I said Wednesday, and I've said it over and over again. You cannot separate your church life from your social life. What you are out there is who you really are. It's not who you are in here. It's not who you are in here. It's who you are out there. Because out there is where you spend most of your time. It's easy to come in here. Be all love and smiles and giggles and happy. Say, I love Jesus. Let me get out there and live like the devil. You see, Jesus pays attention to how we live. 
He paid attention to the church at Ephesus and how they lived. And he rebuked them. He paid attention to the church of Smyrna. And even though they were poor, he didn't find anything against them. And he offered them the crown of life. The victor's crown. The laurel wreath. Having won the race. Paul said, I've run the race. I've finished the course. I've run the race. I've finished the course. Would you bow your heads with me? <coughs> You're in a race. How are you going to finish? It's not how you start. It's how you finish. How are you going to finish today? Father, I ask you right now in Jesus' name that the power of the Holy Spirit that is here this morning to convict our hearts but also to assure us that you care. I ask you, Lord, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to touch your people, to guide us through this offering, this altar time. Show us the way. Show your people the way. Those that are here this morning who may not know you, Lord, as Lord and Savior, I pray that you will speak to their heart right now. Speak to them. Show them your ways. Show them the best this morning. Have your way now, Jesus. Remain with your heads bowed and eyes closed. And I want to say just one couple of things here. If you are feeling a little bit uncomfortable, if you feel the, the tugging at your heart, or, or you feel the, the notion to want to get up and leave, what you need to do is thank God that you feel that way because that means God is still dealing with you. God is still dealing with you and He loves you. And He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And you can make it right with Him this morning. You don't have to live the way you're living. It's not a prerequisite for you. It's not. You can live the way God wants you to live. You can have the things God wants you to have. You can make a statement for the whole world to see. I have decided to follow Jesus.